Welcome to Faith and Freedom Fighters. I'm Robert Muse, co-founder and senior counsel of the American Freedom Law Center, and I am joined by my fellow freedom fighter, co-founder and senior counsel, David Yurishami. Today, we'll focus on the COVID-19 crisis, and we refer here not to the virus, but to the tyrannical response to it. You know, Benjamin Franklin famously stated, quote, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. You know, we were all told early on that these draconian restrictions on our liberty were necessary to reduce hospitalizations and to flatten the curve. And yet when both happened this past summer, the restrictions continued. You know, Americans were good neighbors. We're always willing to lend a helping hand. So it wasn't surprising to see tens of thousands of healthcare workers and volunteers flock to New York to volunteer and assist with the public health emergency as New York was the epicenter of the pandemic. Indeed, we were willing to voluntarily quarantine and to restrict our social interactions to help out our neighbors. But we're also people who are willing to throw tea into the Boston Harbor because we despise tyranny. And when this crisis started to turn into what it has become, a tyrannical grab of power by left-wing politicians, Americans knew that this was wrong and started pushing back. But we need to push back much harder. This cannot become the new norm. You know, leftists have told us time and again that they will not let a good crisis go to waste. And they've been using this crisis to advance their quest for power. They have used it to disrupt our elections during this last general election. They're using it to grow government power and to increase government spending, to promote their pet projects, such as the ridiculous New Green Deal. In short, they're using this power grab to destroy our constitutional republic. Indeed, this is a crisis not a public health crisis, but a constitutional crisis. David, welcome. And now uh, give us your thoughts on, the, on where we stand, you think, with this, uh, this so-called public health crisis, which again, I, is really a, a crisis, a constitutional crisis. Hi, Rob. First of all, um, I want to really focus today on three aspects of this whole COVID-19 uh, conundrum. And that is, first of all, I'd like to talk about the question of what is science versus what is public policy in the decision making that's affecting our lives in terms of all the COVID-19 restrictions, the protocols, etc., so that we can really understand it and try to drill down on it. I'd also like to get into some of the case law you and I have already begun to establish and the cases that we've litigated that exemplify a government seeking power for itself, either because it seeks power or because bureaucrats and technocrats, and I include the judges as technocrats, are fearful and they simply cede power to other politicos in the governmental system, or third, it's part of their progressive view of the world. The government needs more authority over our lives, and this was a crisis that could not go to waste. So those three aspects, one of the things that I hope we can also do, not on this program because it will require too much is to put the COVID-19 crisis in the context of Russiagate and the Obama administration's efforts to one, delegitimize the candidate, Donald Trump, and then ultimately to plant the seeds of a destructive effort by the government bureaucrats and the other aspects of government to undermine Donald Trump's administration. But I want to do it factually and carefully. But before I get into the whole vaccine and COVID-19 questions that'll come up in this broadcast, first of all, uh, today is a fast day for all of our Jewish listeners. They may or may not be listening today and some subsequent time, but I want to wish them an easy fast of Esther, which is the fast right before the holiday of Purim. And 
the holiday of Purim is where Jews are celebrating overcoming a evil political member of government in their day in Persia. And we're going to be celebrating tonight and tomorrow. So I want to wish them a happy Purim. One other thing I want to do on a regular basis before we get into the substance of any particular podcast is to look back just briefly on what we discussed the week before and either add some notation, clean something up if we've misspoke about something so that there's always a continuation from the previous program. Because as conservatives, we appreciate the past and we look at the past realistically and factually. We don't, as progressives tend to do, want to either dismiss the past or entirely recalibrate the past as something evil. So first of all, I wanna make note that we talked a little bit about ourselves and how we got together and we focused and we said we wanted to focus on the fact that individuals, either those of us on the conservative side of political questions, or even conservative versus the more liberal side of the political questions, can have different views of the world, disagree on even their understanding of what the facts are, much less the consequences of those facts, and still be civil. And we noted that you and I come from very different backgrounds. You're an Orthodox Catholic, 12 children. I'm an Orthodox Jew, two children, uh, not by design, but by God's hand. And you and I agree on a lot, but we also have different perspectives and even disagree on enough Yet our discourse, our conversations are always civil and we would like to think rational, even though we can still reasonably disagree with one another. One other note that I want to make that I think makes that special, and I'll kind of let you chime in and then we'll get into the COVID question, is that notwithstanding the radically different backgrounds that you and I have. Your whole family is Marines, you know, your father, your uncle, uh, others before them, some brothers, I understand. Um, your, your wife is the wife of a Marine. Um, and you weren't just a Marine. I don't want to say just a Marine, but you were a combat officer, first Iraq war. And I come from a very, Jewish background, um, very kind of, if I can say, intellectual family. Um, none of my brothers or sisters or, or uh, others were um, in the Marines. My father served in the Air Force, but that was in a time when everybody served. And even though we have this incredible different view of the world and come from a different culture, I've said this to others and I'll say it on this podcast. If I were in a firefight, either a literal firefight or a legal firefight or any other kind of firefight in a foxhole, there is no one that I know and no one in my life that I would rather have guarding my back than Robert J. Muse. And that's a very powerful statement for someone like me in my world, a kind of insular Orthodox Jewish world to say, but I say it unqualifiedly. So as we go through the podcast and discussions going forward, people need to realize that you might disagree with what we have to say but it ought not to engender an emotional animosity. It can engender emotion, but it shouldn't drive one to get angry at us 
it should drive one to think deeply about what they believe in and see either where we're wrong or they're wrong and understand that intellectually. Yeah, thank you, David. That's, and, and I would say, uh, certainly with your, uh, uh, with, the, with the, the fight that you have in you and, and, and your foundation, certainly, you know, as a lawyer, if, if I was ever in myself in need of a lawyer, the first guy, the first call I make is, uh, is to David Urashami. Um, and, and the one thing that, uh, you know, the, the Marine Corps' motto is Semper Fidelis, always faithful. And uh, one thing that I can say about my, uh, my colleague is, is he is someone who very much um, appreciates faithfulness and loyalty and friendship, right? All these things are, are fundamental goods. And, uh, and, and I, it's very interesting because we are somewhat of an odd couple as it were, and, but yet we work so, so well together and have for, for uh, many, many, many years and hopefully many, many more years uh, to continue. Now we do have very different backgrounds. There's no, there's no question about that. Um, and, uh, but the one thing that we have uh, foundationally at its core is a, is a belief in God and, and a belief in not, and not just, you know, not just some superficial belief, but we, but we live our faith. Right. And, and, you know, as I said in the last podcast, you know, our constitution is, is more than just ink on parchment, right? It, it reflects this, this common understanding, these foundational Judeo-Christian principles. If you don't have these foundational Judeo-Christian principles, you don't have freedom. I'm sorry, you just do not, right? As I mentioned before, George Washington famously said in his farewell address, religion and morality are the indispensable supports to our political success. And we see with these left-wing tyrants, they're godless. The left is godless. Anybody, all you have to do is look at their, their policies. Their policies are godless positions. Liberalism inevitably leads to tyranny. And with the foundation Judeo-Christian values, which we try to promote in our individual lives, with our families, but through the work we do, including in this is podcast, which I'd like to think is, is kind of a dimension that we are going to add to this political discourse, more so than, than others who have podcasts, who might just look at it from a legal side or from a political side. We have the legal, we have the political, but we have the faith side, the religious side, which is, quite frankly, is the most important component of this entire argument, of this entire discussion. Without it, it's no longer intellectual. Right. It's it just becomes this Hobbesian, you know, might might makes right. So if you're the person in power, you're the one who determines what is morality. Right. Because you you've now become your own God. That's what the left wants. That's what the liberal wants is to become their own God rather than recognizing that we have one true God. And I think that, you know, the two of us, we acknowledge that our Judeo-Christian values are the foundation to freedom and that everything we do. So while our our cultural and upbringing and everything else might be uh, certainly very, very different at our, at the core, you and I share the most important um, aspect of all that. And that is our, our belief in a, in a God. Absolutely. So let's jump in now to the question of COVID-19. All of the restrictions that have been imposed upon us and by governments around the world. And then hopefully we'll still have time to slide into the question of the vaccine and the vaccination programs and issues that are gonna come up. One of the things that we've heard over and over and over again, and it was a critique of Donald Trump, in fact, it's a critique of every conservative by the left is conservatives deny science or ignore it. And we progressives, we listen to science. We respect science. The classic line is follow the science, right? So all of these protocols, these restrictions, social distancing, shutting down of businesses, enforced mask wearing, all of these various conclusions or policies are driven, we're told, by science. And of course, Fauci and the rest of these individuals are paraded as 
scientific experts. By the way, even on the other side of the coin, you will find doctors um, and others claiming to be scientists who criticize the protocols. Tend, they tend to be silenced by the left in big tech. And people on the other side of the coin will hold them up as you see, I have my experts. I have my scientists who tell me the opposite. And in fact, if you go into any court of law where a scientific question comes up, you'll have experts on one side opining, experts on the other side opining, exactly the opposite. So what is it that we mean when we say science or follow the science? Now, let me just say parenthetically quickly that when the left says follow the science, they can either actually mean it. In other words, they worship science. God is, their science is God, or they don't really mean it. And they're simply using that as a camouflage to do what they want to do in the name of science. So I'm going to lump them both together for now, but let's just now think, what is science? All science is at the end of the day is a measurement of the physical things in the world. That's all it can be. It's measurement. Now, there's things like the scientific process, experimentation, and how that's done. But all that goes to measurement. All science can do as a truth statement is tell us that within a certain degree of probability, this is the measurement that we've taken. That's it. Now, Science has adopted the view that once enough scientists have measured and replicated the same thing over and over and over again, they can reach a scientific consensus. But all that is, is a kind of informal vote by some group of scientists, it's never clear exactly which group and how many scientists make a scientific consensus, but that consensus is never an actual truth. It can only be a assumption by scientists or a conclusion by scientists that the following measured facts allow us to make certain statements about causation, about the past, about the future. So for example, let's just bring it down to an actual example. Scientists can measure things like atmospheric temperature, snow melt, tree rings, radioactivity decay. They can do all of that. They can even measure aspects of the greenhouse effect that takes place in a laboratory or even in an atmospheric condition like Earth. But what they can't know after they've measured various things is that we are actually undergoing global warming from the industrial age because they were never in the industrial age to measure it. And they're making certain scientific consensus decisions about what the facts that they measure today, how they relate back to an unknown past, and even more speculatively, how they relate to an unknown future. Now they might be right about the past and the future, but it isn't a truism. And we know that because scientists have articulated all sorts of consensus opinions that they've later said were wrong. So that's science, as it were, qua science. It measures things, that's all it does. Now, let's now relate that to COVID-19. All the scientists can do, the epidemiologists, the virologists, the immunologists, whatever they're their degree, whatever subject matter or discipline it's in, all they can do is measure 
viruses, uh, what their molecules look like, how big their spikes are, how infectious they are in certain laboratory conditions, how many people are infected over a general population, how many get sick and go to the hospital, what kind of diseases they're suffering as a result of this, seemingly as a result of this virus, how many die as a result in a given population. That is all they can do. None of that science, the measurement of those various things, tells a politician or a bureaucrat like Fauci that a restaurant must shut down or a church must be closed or a synagogue must be closed or that we must stay six feet apart. Those are policy decisions made by bureaucrats and technocrats and politicians based upon what scientists tell them the facts are. But the scientists themselves can't make a better risk assessment than anyone else. So for example, if scientists tell us that COVID-19 is going to infect X number of people in a population of 100, and of that number, Y percent are going to be admitted to a hospital and Z percent are going to die. That doesn't tell us that that risk is worth the societal cost of shutting down an entire economy or engaging in any other kind of restriction. What has to be done is that somebody with different degrees than virology and immunology have to look at the economic cost, the psychological cost of keeping children at home for an entire year. They have to look at the emotional cost. Those kinds of calculations are nearly impossible to do. And it's not enough to say, we have to prevent people from dying as Governor Cuomo and Governor Newsom uh, are, and other governors and mayors are constantly saying, we're doing this to prevent people from dying. Well, what does that mean? People die from things all the time, yet we allow dangerous behavior and fatal behavior to take place every single day, driving a car, probably one of the most dangerous acts that we engage in, yet we permit it because the benefit of driving a car far outweighs the risk of death from a car. It's simply not enough to say that science tells us what COVID-19 can do and how dangerous it may be. The policy decisions are an entirely different question. Science can never tell us as a society or as a person how to behave. It's simply a measurement of things. So that's kind of the start, I think, Rob, of understanding when we start talking about what government has done to impose restrictions on us and what the courts tell us, because the courts rely on science and experts all the time, as you know, we have to know very clearly, science doesn't tell us to wear a mask. It doesn't tell us to social distance. All it can do is measure things. It can't tell us what's good or bad about anything. It can only tell us how big it is. In, in a you know, to the point to what we do, and it can't tell us what does or does not violate the U.S. Constitution. I mean, that's one right. of the other, right? The, it's like science has trumped everything. A couple of, uh, I want to drop a couple of footnotes to, to the, the wonderful comments you just made. One is, you know, I love the left's reliance on science, yet for some reason, they don't include biology in, in that science. And that's a whole nother discussion that we'll have on, on a podcast. Last time I checked, biology was a science, but they seem to reject that and at, uh, at major policy uh, levels. And with regard to uh, Anthony Fauci, I mean, the listeners need to be aware. I mean, this he's been in government since 1984, 37 years as a government bureaucrat. And oh, by the way, and I happen to see this in a uh, article published in uh, Forbes in, in January of this year, he happens to be the highest paid 
federal government employee. He gets paid more than the president of the United States as base salary. And oh, by the way, this science only guy, right? They want to hold him out as this as this gold standard for science. What is what is he doing throwing out the first pitch, you know, in a uh, in a baseball game? Right. This this is an individual who loves the greetings in the marketplace. And if you if you even look, watch his press releases from the uh, press conferences from the beginning of this pandemic to where they are now, he's flip flopped and changed his position uh, so many times, depending on which way the political winds, uh, political winds blow. So don't for a second think that, you know, Anthony Fauci is this sign of kind of science guru. No, this guy is a government bureaucrat who is driven by politics, popularity, a quest for power. He loves to get in front of that microphone. And don't forget that when you're, you know, when you want to rely on, on him. And just, just a couple of, uh, a couple of examples of some of the, you know, the studies that we've seen throughout the course of this, uh, of this pandemic, right? Asymptomatic spread. When you, when you look at all these restrictions that have been imposed upon us, you know, these policy decisions, the vast majority of them are imposed upon people who are asymptomatic, right? And this is, uh, this is what Anthony Fauci, the, the White House Coronavirus Task Force leader, said back in, in January of 2020, quote, even if there's a rare asymptomatic person that might transmit, an epidemic is not driven by asymptomatic carriers. Oh, really? All these policy decisions have been driven by asymptomatic carriers, right? That's what we've been hearing. We, you know, why do we have to wear these masks? I'll get into it. This is a mask that my wife and I both uh, picked up one of these. Um, I'm showing it to those who are watching on video, and obviously you can't see it in podcast. But it says, this mask is as useless as our governor. And that's our, our left-wing Michigan governor, Gretchen Whitmer, who's loving this opportunity to really uh, show her, her tyrannical stripes. But the, uh, this Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, Kirkhove, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, she was, uh, uh, she's with the World Health Organization, and she said that secondary transmission from asymptomatic individuals is, quote unquote, very rare. That was in June of 2020. And she noted the problem of identifying people who are pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic, as well as the fact that some people experience such mild systems that they may be classified as asymptomatic. Again, think about that. How, how many of you out there are being forced to wear masks, being forced to quarantine, being forced not to go to restaurants, having your business shut down, forced to be shut down, all because you're you're asymptomatic. Nobody has nobody has the virus, symptoms of the virus. But yet, this is Fauci and the World Health, uh, the health organization, you know, from the very beginning, in this uh, when this uh, the pandemic started. So it's yeah, it, this has been so politicized. And, uh, you know, the, and the mask issue, too, is, uh, is very interesting. And if I, if I may, David, I got a couple of uh, points I'd like to make on, on that while I'm talking about some of these studies. This was a study that was posted on the Centers for Disease Control website in May of 2020. And it concludes, and I'm going to quote, this is a conclusion from this very thorough study done by, by researchers and scientists published in all the scientific journals. It said, quote, Disposable medical masks, also known as surgical masks, are loose fitting devices that were designed to be worn by medical personnel to protect, to protect accidental contamination of patient wounds and to protect the wearer against splashes or sprays of bodily fluids. There is limited evidence for their effectiveness in preventing influenza virus transmission, either when worn by the infected person for source control or were worn by uninfected persons to reduce exposure. Our systematic review found no significant effect of masks on transmissions of laboratory confirmed influenza, end quote. And, and these were, you know, in, uh, in March of 2020, Dr. Mike Ryan, who is the director of, uh, of the World Health, uh, World Health Organization Health Emergency Program said, quote, there's no specific evidence to suggest that the wearing of masks by the mass population has any potential benefit. In fact, there's some evidence to suggest the opposite in the misuse of wearing a mask properly or fitting it properly. In a study by the Centers for Disease Control, September of 2020, it was reported based on the review of the data that in the 14 days before illness onset, before uh, showing symptoms of, uh, of COVID-19, 71% of case patients and 74% of control patients reported that they always wear face coverings, masks, or other mask types when in public. So more than two thirds of the people 
who've, who've con contracted it said that they have mass. And then even more recent study that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine conducted at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, hardly you know, a bastion of conservatism. They recruited over 6,000 participants, half wore surgical masks in public and half did not. About close to 4,000 people, 4, uh, 5,000 people, 4,860 people completed the study. Out of that group, 1.8% of the people who wore the mask got infected and 2.1% who did not wear the mask got infected. And the outcome of the study was that the difference is not significantly, significantly or statistically significant. Let me get that correct. And this is what Dr. Henning Bungard, if I'm pronouncing it right, he was the lead author of the study. He said publicly, quote, our study gives an indication of how much you gain from wearing a mask, not a lot, end quote. And, and yet, you know, these, I call it my, the symbol of oppression, right? It's, it's a way to me that, you know, it creates this paradox. It creates this, this sense of fear and panic because when you look around, everybody has their, has their face covered up. But it also it creates this false sense of security. Oh, I'm wearing my, you know, little cloth mask, so I can't get COVID-19, I mean, this is, it's all diabolical. What's, uh, and, I, and I think the mask, and, and I, I find it, the mask to me, I find particularly offensive because, you know, we're made in the image and likeness of God and, and we're social beings. And it, it's so important that we, you know, that we maintain that, that image and that, that social interaction, yet the mask hides that, right? It's, it's, it's hiding our humanity. It's depriving us of our humanity. It's, it's making us antisocial. It's isolating us, right? And that's there's just something diabolical, uh, diabolical about that. And and yet now you have Fauci, you know, advocating wearing two masks. For goodness sakes, I mean, this is you can't make this stuff up. It's absolutely crazy where we are, but it's tyrannical. And and one last point, and I I saw early on a um, a Wall Street Wall Street Journal political cartoon. It was perfect. It had a an image of a of a person wearing a mask, and the mask strings were going up to this, uh, you know, this this puppet master who was controlling the individual. And that's what this is. This is all, you know, creating a crisis, creating panic so that we have to feel like the government has to take care of us and, and, and we have to, you know, we have to rely on them. It allows them to gain more power. And, you know, the other thing when you think about it, this, this so violates our own bodily integrity and personal autonomy. It makes all of us, in effect, a patient of the government forcing us to wear these masks in, uh, in public. And, you know, we, we're challenging the mask mandate in, uh, in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the, the mandate here in Michigan requiring K through five school children to wear a mask all day long. You know how many, how many children K through five are, in, are adversely affected by COVID? Like zero. You know, it's not even in all the state of Pennsylvania. They, you can't even find the statistics because it, it, it's, not even, it's not even reportable. There was zero. The only one I've heard of who uh, the unfortunate death of a, of a youth here in Michigan from COVID, the, the child also had meningitis, you know? So what was, the, what was the, the root cause of it? But they're forcing all these kindergarten kids to wear a mask all day long in school. I mean, just the psychological impact and effect on that, they could care less, nobody's even looked at it. So this, and this goes to your point about, you know, science and policy. These are all policy decisions. They're, they're blaming them as it were, as an excuse, scapegoating them to science, but these are just policy decisions of tyrants. And it's got to stop. Yeah. And what I'd like to do is lead into some of the cases that kind of articulate this problem in spades, as it were. But before going there, let's just focus on that very nice landscape that you've just drawn out for us. Science, properly speaking, can simply measure how infectious COVID-19 is and whether a mask allows air in or out, or they can measure if certain people get infected or not um, over a period of time. But in order to really understand the effectiveness of a mask on influenza generally, on COVID-19 specifically, would require very, very carefully conducted studies that have simply not been done. Now, it's not that infectious diseases like influenza have not been around, and it's not like mask and the study of mask and their effectiveness have not been around before COVID-19 came on the scene. We know in Japan, for example, it's very cultural that if you're sick or other people around you are sick to wear masks is 
is kind of the norm. But the reality is science had conducted some studies, but as Fauci and others said rather honestly at the beginning of COVID-19, or dishonestly, we'll talk about that, there wasn't a lot of evidence that masks were effective. To this day, there still isn't any real evidence, demonstrative evidence, or scientific consensus, which is not scientific evidence. That's a bunch of scientists looking at measurements and then having a general consensus among themselves. But that doesn't exist. There isn't a consensus among those researchers who actually do the studies that mask wearing works or that social distancing works. So Fauci and others came out early on. Now we're told now that they disclaim mask wearing because they didn't want people running out and buying masks. In other words, it had nothing to do with science. It was a policy decision, yet when they told us not to wear masks, it was scientific not to wear masks. And now they're telling us it's scientific to wear masks. That is simply false. It's not scientific. Science, again, just measures certain things. They're making policy decisions about our freedom. But where does Fauci or any other epidemiologist or virologist or any other scientist know or calculate the risks to society, economically, socially, psychologically, of imposing all of these restrictions without adequate scientific measurements to even tell us that these measures are in fact effective. Take a look, for example, at just how the, 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 the curve of infection has gone up and down. When we were first all getting infected, and of course one would expect that in a society that had not seen COVID-19 before, and governments, state governments and others had started imposing all these restrictions, the infection rate began to drop. But when did it drop? During the summer months, when many people who had studied a host of influenza viruses said it would drop. Then when did it pick up again? As the weather cooled. But what did the scientists and the, and the governors and the public health departments tell us? These were reactions to us getting together on Thanksgiving, during Christmas, during the high holiday period for the Jews. That's the root cause of this increased infection rate but they did not know that. And in fact, you could just as likely have collated all of those infections to the weather change. As we got past the new year and we're now into February, March, across the country and across the world, we're seeing the infection rate go down again. But again, we're past the period of the heavy winter months, people still had Christmas, people still had New Year. So why are the infection rates dropping? They're opening up the restaurants. They're allowing more people to protest. They're allowing more people uh, to get together in synagogues, yet the infection rate continues to drop. Why is that? Science and the public policy decision makers have no basis either in their measurements or in the rationale for the kinds of restrictions they're imposing on society based upon what we've seen over the course of the past year. And when you actually get into litigating with governors and mayors and the public health department directors and asking them, what is your evidence of this? The answers are even more vague than they are on television because they can't say something literally false under oath. So they begin to have this double speak where they just mumble through the risk, the dire risk, and they talk 
and platitudes about how it's only logical that being six feet apart, or as Fauci says, why does Fauci say two masks are better than one? In his own words, well, it's only logical if one mask is somewhat effective, which we haven't established, two masks must be, must be better. Well, then why aren't three masks better or five masks? And obviously I can stop all infections by simply requiring everyone to stop breathing so that everyone would die from suffocation, but I could stop the spread of this disease. But that is not just silly, it's stupid, and it's dangerous, but that's the logic they're using. Yeah. Go it, ahead. It, it's a, a couple quick points there. You know, with, with the mask, and, you know, I, I showed the viewers, and again, this, this mask that I, that qualifies as a mask under the, under the various restrictions can be almost, can be almost anything. It's not like we're, we're, you know, even with the studies, certainly the N95 mask, which nobody can get a hold of unless you're a, 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 a qualified medical personnel. They used to sell them in the stores. You can't find them. I know I can't find them. Sure, that might have some benefit, but when you look at the restraint, anything, anything cloth, you, you can put a bandana over your face, anything qualifies for them as a uh, as a mask. So there's, so even to get that objective criteria, you're going to have so many variables that it, it's almost going to be impossible to do it in a true scientific manner. And, and, you know, and go to the, your, your point about science and being measured. And, and, you know, we, I had the lawsuit in Pennsylvania and I cross-examined during a hearing, the, uh, the expert that was identified by the Pennsylvania Department of Health. And one of the basic questions I asked her, so what is the, what is the objective criteria that you're going to use to rely on to stop these mandates, right? So if, what is it? Is it, is it hospitalizations at a certain percentage? Is it uh, you know numbers of death at a certain percentage? Is it numbers of case at a certain possessions? They have no idea. They're not even thinking about how do we get ourselves out of this predicament. They don't have any idea whatsoever what the end date or what the objective criteria are for the end date, which goes to the point that this has nothing to do with science. If it had to do with science, then you could say objectively, when we reach this threshold, this measurement, then we know it's safe to do you know to do X or to do Y. They have no clue. No answer. It was absolute, absolute crickets. Even and this was before the, the vaccine was coming in. I said, what about after the vaccine? Or um, even, you know, the, even by her own admission, if you've if you've had COVID-19, then you apparently are immune from it for at least 90 days. I think that's I mean, that's even using this witness's um, expertise, 90 days. But yet anybody who's had the uh, COVID-19 still has to wear a mask during that. The 200 something thousand people that had COVID-19 in Pennsylvania, they still have to wear a mask, even though by her, they're not even infectious. They can't get it, nor can they transmit it. But yet they still have to wear a mask. Their mask mandate in Pennsylvania, I'm, again, I'm using Pennsylvania because this is where we have litigation. They imposed that mandate in, in July of 2020. July, right when, right when everything, the hospitalizations had had totally decreased number of cases, number of deaths, yet they imposed this mandate during the time when supposedly, as they told us in the beginning, if we flatten the curve and reduce hospitalizations, you know, these restrictions will be lifted. They imposed that restriction. And oh, by the way, that restriction was still in place all the way through November when we had this absolute surge in, in coronavirus, going to your point about, you know, weather and, and, and so forth. And, and so it, to me, it's always, if these masks are so beneficial, a soul useful, then, okay, make people wear them, but open up everything. Let people go out and let them go to the restaurants, go to the stores, do all the things that they would normally um, just, you know, when your interaction with people wear masks, but they're not doing that. So it's, it's, it, it doesn't even make sense from a, from a policy perspective, but going back to the original point, when I try, when I try to nail them down to what is the objective criteria, you know, what's your scientific criteria, what's your data that you're using to end these restrictions that you've imposed on us? Crickets, no idea. They haven't even thought about it because they love power. That's what this is all about. It's power. Well, and I would I would make the additional point, and I think that's absolutely right about power, is that there's a confusion about what science can say and what it can't say. Mm -hmm. All science can do is measure. It can't have, there's no scientific criteria for when you stop wearing masks or you stop social distancing because there's no scientific criteria for when you do wear masks. Because again, all science does is measure, presumably 
some level of certainty about the effectiveness of mask wearing, but that doesn't tell you when you should wear a mask. Even if we say that masks are proven to be 100% effective against all diseases, well, should as a society, we impose a burden that everyone always wear a mask when out in public? That would stop the spread of all diseases. And even after COVID-19 goes, there's always another COVID-19-like virus, God forbid, waiting in the, you know, in the wings, as it were, to make its appearance. We're being told that by Bill Gates and others all the time. So maybe government should tell us, always wear a mask. Science can't tell us that. All science can say is masks are X effective or Y effective to some degree of certainty. Never 100% certainty, but to some degree. That's all it can tell us. So it's no surprise that an expert doesn't have a scientific criteria. All an expert can do is talk about the measurement of masks. A policy person, a public policy technocrat or bureaucrat, and we use that those terms just so everyone understands. A bureaucrat is someone who works in government who just kind of does ministerial clerical work over and over and over again. A technocrat is a bureaucrat who has some kind of expertise, scientific, legal, or what have you. But they're the same animal. They themselves are making policy decisions and informing politicians who impose their restrictions or their edicts, but it's not based on science. It might utilize scientific measurements, but they're making calculations about risk that they're not prepared to tell us about. And that's what Rob's litigation in Philadelphia showed. When you ask them, okay, what are your policy criteria? And what is that based on? What is your calculation? How much damage are you prepared to do the economy to save how many people? Please tell us that. They don't have any idea. They haven't done that. They're just throwing these restrictions out literally from the hip. They don't have any actual criteria that they can talk about. They just all sit around and have a consensus about how much power they want to absorb on any given day. Now, I want to talk about another piece of litigation that gets to this point, I think, emphatically. We represent a woman in Manhattan, Pamela Geller. She has a certain notoriety of being a, uh, the individual who really began the groundswell of opposition to what was called the Ground Zero Mosque, the mosque they wanted to build on the place of the 9-11 bombing. And she's been a free speech advocate on many issues. And we've represented her successfully in court across the country, uh, especially on transit advertisement space. When she's wanna run an ad pro-Israel against the Palestinian terrorist, against terrorists generally, and the transit authorities try to shut her down. And we've sued and in the main been very successful. And even when we're not successful in court, the result is the transit authorities stop allowing any kind of issue advertise, oriented advertisements, which is a good thing in our viewpoint from our perspective. But Pamela Geller wanted to protest in New York City, especially in City Hall, but throughout. But there was a governor. Cuomo edict, executive order, and a Mayor de Blasio executive order that said, you can't protest at all unless you're a single individual, but you can't form groups and have any kind of public activity, even though they allowed all sorts of other public activity. We sued and uh, eventually that restriction was lessened to be 10 people, then 25 people, then ultimately 50 people. The judge ruled that that restriction was perfectly legitimate, even though it violated Pamela Geller's First Amendment rights, because when facing something as terrible as COVID-19, the courts must shut their eyes to any kind of real analysis of why the restrictions were imposed in the first place. And they relied on a very old case that came about at the turn of the last century. We appealed that decision. And during the interim, 
Black Lives Matter burst onto the scene after the George Floyd death. And Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio were on TV, on radio, embracing the protesters, embracing their message, embracing their right to protest, but saying, please don't be violent and abide by our curfew. And if you can, you know, wear your mask, stay six feet apart. But in fact, what did we see? We saw police chiefs of New York City. We saw Mayor de Blasio literally participate in the Black Lives Matter protest without a mask, no social distancing, and in violation of the 25 person limit or the 50 person limit, whatever it was at the time, it was always changing. So we argued to the appellate court that obviously this executive order isn't a necessary executive order to save lives because the governor and the mayor and the police embraced the Black Lives Matter protest. The court said, well, you're gonna have to refile your lawsuit to allege all of those facts about the Black Lives Matter protest. So we did, we dismissed the appeal, we refiled a new complaint and we allege that the Black Lives Matter protest and the embrace of those protests by the governor, by the mayor, by the police illustrates expressly that the restriction on free speech rights cannot be a necessary prohibition that violates free speech in support of a compelling state interest. Because if it were, they would pose it on the Black Lives Matter. We lose in the trial court and we appeal again to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals of covers New York State. And guess what Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio say? In response to the judge's very, very harsh questioning. How do you prevent Ms. Geller from protesting and allow Black Lives Matters to protest? Their response was, Governor Cuomo, well, I'm not going to enforce the, my executive order against Ms. Geller. I leave that up to the city. So the good judges turned to the city defendants and asked their lawyers, well, are you going to enforce this against Ms. Geller? And their answer a day later, in writing was no, we're not going to enforce it. In other words, we're going to impose a restriction on free speech rights that we're not going to enforce against the Black Lives Matter protesters. And now we tell the courts, we're not even going to enforce that restriction against Ms. Geller because she sued us in federal court. But against everybody else, we still want to prevent them from having and exercising their free speech rights. Now, to anyone with any kind of rational thought, that would be an impossible position to maintain. You can't say that the executive order is necessary to stop the spread of a deadly disease, but say you're going to allow Black Lives Matter protesters and Ms. Geller because she sued us and anyone else who sued us, we're going to what, carve out an exception for them as well? That's the kind of science, the kind of policy criteria that the state of New York and the city of New York have imposed upon millions of New Yorkers. It's an absolutely irrational, well, irrational, if not irascible, policy that can't be justified neither by science nor policy. Yet that's where we are. And we're nor constitutionally. I just add that because that's right. right. That's one of the main issues with all of this is that we have a constitution. We have fundamental freedoms. You can't justify that. You just can't. It's absurd. Right. Because it's not just whether or not it's rational, as Rob pointed out, it has got to satisfy the constitutional analysis that the courts have imposed upon restrictions on free speech now for decades, and it doesn't. But the judges who allow it, and it's most judges, not all, but certainly most, is either because 
They simply claim fear of death, fear of this disease. I can't take the risk of challenging the governor or Mayor de Blasio because if someone should, God forbid, die based upon my ruling, what would I do? I mean, that's literally the kind of thinking that the courts go through or because they actually embrace the power grab of progressives, that they want to see government take more and more power to, as it were, rescind the constitutional liberties that we have piece by piece, chunk by chunk. Yet, it, it takes place every day. Well, that's, you know, I, I always, uh, with this Black Lives Matter, because it wasn't just de Blasio and, and, uh, and Como. Here in Michigan, we had Governor Whitmer, who was cracking down on social gatherings and, you know, uh, virtue signaling to all of us that we are such evil people. If we ever thought we'd get, you know, family members would get together where it ex exceeded the number of 10 people. Yet there she is, you know, arm in arm, no social distancing with hundreds and hundreds of protesters, many of them rioters. And uh, also you had uh, Governor Wolf out in Pennsylvania, right? The uh, uh, condemning anyone who would dare violate his order, they're going to, you know, cause deaths. He had hundreds, if not thousands of people marching in Harrisburg. And there's, there's uh, Governor Wolf arm in arm, right? It's, it was interesting. I always said, if you, you know, apparently the way to end a pandemic is you have a riot, right? That's, but yet, you know, and, and even, you know, continue that Black Lives Matter riots that happened all summer long, attacking federal buildings. And yet you see the way um, a handful of people are vilified because of what happened at the, uh, at the Capitol. But hey, uh, David, I think this is probably a, a good point to, uh, to wrap up this podcast. That's a great case. I've, there's more to cover. And I think perhaps the beginning, the next one, we pick up where we left off with some of the, uh, some of the other cases dealing with the COVID issue, because all of this, you know, all of this uh, ties into the, the main issue, right? We call ourselves the, uh, you know, faith and freedom fighters, because it is, we're fighting for freedom. And at the core is the, is the question of, of, our, of our faith. And these tyrannical bureaucrats, they want to be God. They're imposing these restrictions on our freedoms, on our liberties. Um, and, and we have to fight back. I mean, that's, that's the, uh, the, bottom, the bottom line. And, uh, you know, we need to fight back harder. Um, you know, anyone who's listening to this podcast, we need to we need to push back on these on these government restrictions so they don't even come close to being our our new norm. So, unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have today. We we do look forward to our next uh, discussion. We thank all of you who have spent the time to to join us and to listen. Uh, please know that we will continue our relentless fight for faith and freedom. And may God bless you, and may He continue to bless America. Amen. Thank you, Rob. Thank you.